Hello and welcome. I'm Nancy Saucer and I am sitting here in the Emerson Gallery at McLean Project for the Arts. Um, I am a curator and artistic director here. And um, I'd like to welcome you to our spring solo shows. Um, we're surrounded by some of the art and you just saw um, some installation shots of uh, what's going on here in the galleries. Um, the three artists that we're featuring, um, Melanie Quijos, Matt Pinney and uh, James Stephen Terrell were all chosen from over 200 artists who responded to an open call for proposals. Um, and they were chosen for the quality and originality of their work. Each is very different from the other. Um, Matt Penny making figurative, imaginatively allegorical works from oil and pastel. James Stephen Terrell making acrylic paintings full of figures, patterns, and electric color interaction. Um, and Melanie Quijos making um, incredibly intricate, um, wonderful storied light boxes. Um, as it turns out, they do have a few things in common, despite immediate appearances. Um, all three are storytellers, creating spaces and places for viewers to visit within the edges of their works, and all are very interested in color, how it interacts, blends, and defines mood. And lucky for us, all three are also all teachers as well, um, very able to articulate, or, and very able and articulate when it comes to talking about their art. Um, we're going to start with Melanie. Melanie Quijos is an Arlington, Virginia based artist originally from Wisconsin. She received a BA in studio art from Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin, and an MFA from the University of Wisconsin Madison. She has exhibited extensively throughout Wisconsin, Southern California, and the DMV. Currently, she teaches drawing at Arlington Art Center, youth art at the US Art Center at Chantilly manages the Arlington Visual Art Studio Tour and is on the board of the Guild of American Paper Cutters. Welcome, Melanie. Thanks so much, Nancy. And thanks to everyone who's shown up tonight. I'm so excited to talk about my work and answer any questions. Um, so we can go to that first slide, thanks. Nancy mentioned that I went to Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin, which is a small, liberal arts university. And so I think you'll see that interdisciplinary component in my work. That's where I started this very graphical kind of style. A lot of people ask me how I started paper cutting and this was a brief history of my journey. So I started with these digital prints and I loved the, the graphical look, but they ended up feeling very flat. So I tried painting decided I was not really a painter. And I tried screen printing during my time at UW-Madison because I was in the graphics department. That's where they shoehorned me in, or in, in the printmaking department. So I had to try screen printing. Decided that I really don't like the process of screen printing, nor do I care about multiples. So I um, actually went back to this experiment of cutting foam for a while and I actually cut foam, craft foam before paper, which you see in the lower left. So we can go to the next slide. For some reason, I wasn't interested in framing these pieces. I felt like once I framed the, my cutouts, they were kind of dead. So I kept on cutting and I kept on trying to find ways to present them in a, um, a non-standard manner. And I started making these boxes for them, hand, handmade painted boxes. And once I added a light to the back, it all just clicked for me. It kind of felt like I was looking into a, a new little world, like a diorama at a museum. And it created this sense of wonder that I've been trying to incorporate in my work ever since. Another commonality throughout these um, experiments was the presence of stories. So I started with interactions between people, that being the story, then into rituals, and then into the idea of where did these rituals come from? I think a light bulb moment for me was as a child, I was very familiar with the pinata, the, uh, the common game that kids play at birthday parties. And 
suddenly it just clicked to me when I saw, when I heard someone say the word pinata with the enye and everything, oh, it's not from here. It's Mexican. It's, it's a Spanish word. How did I not realize that before? And so I started thinking about, well, what other things are from other places? Now I'm, now I'm talking like way long ago, but that interest has been in my mind ever since childhood. And I did actually make this piece about pinatas in 2010. We can go to the next slide. So where do our cultural practices come from has been a central question of my work ever since then. And that is the, um, the central component of all the pieces in my show at MPA in labor and leisure. So here we have brief history of tobacco. Where did this tradition, this ritual, this leisure activity of smoking come from? I go back to the Taino people in the Caribbean who first introduced tobacco to Columbus in the top scene. And I weave my way through the centuries uh, in a connected fashion, trying to show the connections through the smoke rising up and going into the, the medieval ages when it was used as medicine, um, some focus on the component of enslaved labor in the new world all throughout um, uh, most of the colonies, there were tobacco farms. And then into the introduction of cigarettes in World War I, because cigarettes were so much easier to smoke than a pipe in the trenches um, and, and to today. So I'm trying to pick out little moments in the history of these things that I find either surprising or visually interesting. We can go next, thank you. Uh, I wanted to include some of my influences. Now, obviously, Kara Walker, everyone mentions her when they, they see my work because she's the most famous paper cutter working today. But probably even more than the fact that she's a paper cutter, I love how she brings history into her work. Um, it's a central component of her work, American history, Annabelle, Annabellum South and our history of slavery. And although he's not a paper cutter, Yinka Shonibare is so close to my heart in what he's doing with his installations and his videos, making these lush experiences for the viewer that have a darker underpinning in global history and trade and production. We can go to the next one. So like Kara Walker, I also decided that the history of sugar was something I wanted to delve into. And so we have a refined display here, which is one of the chapters in my sugar history series. And this focuses on the changing uses of sugar as well as the production. So in this case, in the Renaissance, the use was these subtleties. Again, also Kara Walker, if anyone's familiar with her massive subtlety. Um, which were sugar sculptures that the rich people made to show off their wealth. And then the guests would eat them at the end of the party. And then hovering over their heads is the scene of the enslaved people and the, the slave driver, kind of as if the whole system could topple over these um, oblivious consumers. My pieces always have, oh, we can actually Go back a little. My pieces always have this component of the painted exterior. So I'm inspired by the cultures that I'm depicting in the scenes. This piece is based on a West African mask. And I loved how the colors and the diamond pattern could easily fall into that Renaissance scene as well. So I love it when you can actually see the cross-cultural components come in through the patterns somewhat serendipitously. And I just want to give out, uh, give a shout out to some of my assistants. All of these pieces are hand painted. And occasionally I will ask one of my friends or family. So my mom, Mary Key Haas, uh, Renee DeBoer and Margaret Brandt, if you're out there, thanks for helping with the, with doing some of the underpainting on these. And now we can go on. 
But of course, the paper cutting is the central part of my work. I have become much more intricate in my cutting. I think you probably have noticed this is the, the most recent piece in the show and also the most detailed. That's largely inspired by my participation in the Guild of American Paper Cutters in learning about the history of paper cutting and being inspired by my really talented colleagues. So I've included here a piece by uh, one of my former ex-board members from GAP, her Sharon Schnitte work, which also follows this sort of hierarchical uh, layered landscape of a pastoral scene, which I'm kind of thinking about when I design my own pieces. I cut with a knife and I draw on the back first to design the piece. Then I uh, usually make two pieces. One will be a light box, another one I do frame. So I actually got over my framing uh, fear <laughs> after quite some time. Now, uh, foul play and egg money is focused mostly on production, not so much the consumption. And that's very central to Labor and Leisure, the show that, um, that is up right now. And in the history of raising chickens, we see a lot of women's history. So not only through famous people like Queen Victoria, who popularized fancy hen and, and uh, chicken breeding, to the anonymous enslaved women who were able to buy their freedom by selling fried chicken to Civil War soldiers. And people like Celia Steele, who was the first person ever to make raising broiler chickens profitable. And she's in the third scene. So I love it when I can bring out the stories of people who aren't in the history books, um, all the uh, underrepresented folks. So um, that's uh, that. Those are my remarks. I hope I kept it to under ten minutes. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. All right. Next. Next up is Matt Penny. Um, he's a painter living and working in Washington D.C. and received a Bachelor of Arts and Religious Studies from Indiana University a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting, also from Indiana University, and a Master of Fine Arts from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. He's a professor at Northern Virginia Community College in Manassas, and has been actively exhibiting his work since around 2004, um, with about eight solo shows to his credit, multiple two and three person exhibits, and participation in many curated and juried shows throughout the Mid-Atlantic region in the Midwest. Matt? Okay, well, thank you, Nancy. Uh, well, I, I wanted to talk about my paintings. My process is, I think, very different from Melanie, for example. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of it is, uh, almost every one of them is either right before uh, the pandemic hit or, um, or during the, uh, the last two years. And uh, this one was actually one of the first paintings I started uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. I, I started it in March of 2020. And, uh, you know, we were all just kind of going into lockdown and not knowing what was happening and what to do. And I, I was just kind of thinking about this relationship between the isolation that we all knew was oncoming and, uh, you know, kind of looking for what our companionship was gonna look like. And, you know, I, I, I kind of, honestly, immediately I had friends adopting dogs. And I, I thought that was really, you know, such a kind of a sweet thing to paint about is kind of finding companionship in whatever they, you could get. Um, and I also at this time started using um, oil uh, crayons, which are uh, an encaustic oil-based painting stick. Um, and uh, they were really a kind of a remarkable change. I, I'm, I love drawing. I do most of, most of the time I'm drawing. Uh, I go to paintings when I'm ready to paint. Um, and the oil sticks kind of gave me an opportunity to start thinking about paintings in a drawing format. Um, 
from the beginning and then to incorporate paint with it. Uh, and so in this painting, it really was where I started using the oil sticks and, and it allowed me to get kind of a, a different color relationship uh, in, in things. Um, and I was just thinking about like a, a dusk moment uh, getting with the pinks and the greens and the different sources of light and, and this just kind of intimate moment of, of reaching out for companionship. And I think we all kind of wanted to figure out how we were going to make it through this time, you know, this un, undefined amount of time with a lot of fear uh, and looking for stuff that's familiar. Um, Peter Doig has been a big influence on my work uh, in recent years. And uh, this painting is, is definitely partially inspired by Peter Doig. Uh, the way that he thinks in kind of a, a real, but also a spiritual term uh, is, you know, something that really interested me, something that I wanted to try and express in, in a very simple terms, you know, just kind of uh, how people relate, how they feel, how an environment becomes maybe a little extra, uh, a little something more than, than the normal day to day. And, and, you know, that time just felt more, a lot more <laughs> than a normal day to day uh, at the beginning. And I think we're, you know, starting to feel a little bit uh, less of that pressure. It's, I, I would say, I, it feels really good that we're not having to, um, be as concerned as we were before. Uh, and, uh, but this painting really kind of started me and I, I really started in a place of thinking, all right, this is a big moment, make big paintings. And that really changed as I went forward. Uh, if you'll advance to the next slide, please. Uh, this painting was about uh, six months before. And, and uh, this is a uh, problem with St. Michael. It's a painting about uh, how we think about nature and inconveniences of nature. Um, and uh, I was kind of thinking back, I like, like I like to do on old stories. Um, and St. Michael is one of the dragon slayers. Uh, and uh, the idea in this painting was how we think about pests and things that are, you know, we, that might be a problem for our convenience. Um, and in the background, I don't know if you can see, there's a guy with a spear uh, outlined and then on the left side there's the dragon uh, breathing fire and in the foreground is a woman reading a book uh, and she's kind of contemplating whether it's a good idea to kill the dragon and, uh, and the idea here is that maybe you know we dealing with these pests isn't what we really you know killing them off and exterminating them isn't going to help us in the long term um, and kind of accepting what they are and what uh, they bring to our world, despite things that aren't good. Um, it, it, was, it was important to me. Um, I'm also really playing with color again in this piece uh, and trying to see what I can do with the surface of a painting. And that's always probably, you know, 80% of the inspiration comes with the formal qualities of the paint, seeing what I can make the paint do, uh, go after this kind of luminous quality uh, different lighting situations. Uh, and with that, I've been, you know, working with a process that involves a squeegee where I will paint the entire painting, bring it down with a squeegee, and then maybe go back into it a little bit. Um, and, but that process gets repeated because there's so much failure involved. And, and I'm always, you know, there's so many variables that can't be controlled that I, at times, you know, it'll take 20 layers to get the paintings to come together and to feel like they're working or I didn't smudge the wrong part and lose the personality of the person or, the, uh, or their, you know, essential shapes. Um, and and, and that, that's a big part of how I am thinking about how to make a painting based off of a narrative that I use as a beginning point. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, this painting is actually very recent. Uh, I, I, right around the end of the um, last year or beginning of 2022, I can't remember. I think it was 2021 when it was completed. Um, and you know, this is 
one of my friends described it to me as probably the most cathartic painting that I've done. Um, and it's just this idea of releasing, you know, all of the trouble with the past um, and kind of finding a way to begin again and move forward, uh, burning all the furniture, right? You know, there's the house and the furniture and letting go uh, and moving forward. Uh, and he's holding a, a dining table here um, and it's partially kind of protecting him from the heat of this intense fire. Uh, and, uh, but he's, it's ready to go into um, looking out at the viewer. This group of paintings was, came together very fast. I think from December through uh, April, beginning of April, uh, I, I just kind of went on a tear and, and I found a process uh, that really was about how to activate paint uh, in a, a new way. I, I think, you know, the, uh, it's not that different a process than I've used in the past, but it, it felt much more clear and understandable about how to work through it. Um, and I uh, was able to work out a lot of narratives that I had been struggling with for some time. Uh, this one and um, you know some of the earlier ones that I showed uh, and a couple of the ones that are coming up, they, they really became about color and surface more than they had in the past. And while the narrative is still strong and there, um, it really you know, became about how to manipulate the paint in a new way, you know, to use brushes where brushes would be helpful. Uh, to use the squeegee in other areas uh, and uh, to work those two back and forth. Um, and I, I felt this one actually is kind of my favorite in the show. It makes me, I don't know, feel um, like I've kind of made a breakthrough. And, uh, you know, I'm working on new paintings now that are partially following this process. Uh, and it, it feels good to, to you know, have this one become to be around still and in the show uh, with McLean. And I, I don't know, I like it. Oh, to the next slide, please. Uh, and I think this is a, the title here is what I wanted to title the show, uh, McLean, or where do we go from here? You know, I think we all have a lot of questions uh, about, you know, what happens as this pan pandemic winds down, um, as you know, the issues like climate change become more and more pressing. Um, and so many of the assumptions that we made in the past uh, become um, things that we have to really renegotiate how we're thinking about, how we're gonna act on, what we're gonna do going forward. Um, you know, I, this is based off of an Aang painting. Uh, probably many of you know uh, the one I'm talking about and uh, what struck me about the painting other than Aang being just such a great incredible draftsperson and artist uh, was the kind of the thought process that's evident in the model and I really wanted to capture that that kind of feeling in a place where I'm alone um, and and really contemplating what I'm doing where I'm going What's next? Um, and I, I really got that feeling from her. And there's also this kind of relationship with her through the door. Uh, that's something I changed from the original painting. Uh, she's, you know, being observed. And we're all kind of waiting for somebody to take the lead. Um, and that for me was her kind of knowing she's being observed and being observed in this relationship between the viewer and her um, and, and how we're gonna move forward in that moment, in this moment. Now, uh, if you can go on to the next slide. Uh, this is a little bit different take. I, I have a lot of pastels. Pastels are really kind of my beginning of my process. Uh, I think about them as uh, pre-paintings where I have all the uh, ability to experiment and play and do things that I, you know, with, with painting, it, it's, you know, I have more time to wait for it to dry and I have to 
uh, plan myself much, be much better about planning what I'm gonna do. Um, and, and this one is one of the pastels where it's really just kind of working out an idea. Um, and I, I, I'm always kind of thinking about how people are interacting with each other, both positively and negatively. And the idea here was the guy had tripped and fallen and these guys are on a bench laughing about it you know, partially maybe wanting to help him or something like that, but also laughing at him. And, and it's, you know, there's in an online world, which we've all really spent more time on in the last two years, I think, than we have in any time before, um, that that kind of cruelty is, is part of our world now, uh, how people can act online and be different than they would in real life. And I think I see some of that being brought into real life, you know, the, the forgetting that you are interacting with a real person or, or looking for a, you know, a video that you can make or something like that. Um, and in this drawing, that was kind of a, a quick moment of feeling that's how so many, so many interactions are these days. We could go on. The next slide. Uh, and th this is another pastel. I love to do pastels when I'm traveling. They're you know easy to pack up. Uh, this was my first vacation with my mother uh, in 2021, summer of 2021. You know, I, I I really needed to get out of the house at that point, and we went down to Puerto Vallarta in Mexico, and stayed at a resort and sat on the beach every day. And I would do drawings every day down there. Uh, I probably did seven drawings in seven days, um, which is wonderful. And I just kind of loved how everyone was kind of basking in that same moment. You know, their first time getting out, almost everyone I met with had, hadn't left, you know, their, their neighborhood or their um, town in a year and a half. Uh, and uh, I, I particularly love this couple that was sitting there. Uh, just enjoying themselves and uh, sitting in the sun, you know, avoiding the shade of the umbrella, drinking margaritas all day. Uh, and uh, so I made this drawing among some other ones. Um, and it just really is part of the change in my practice over the pandemic became about making things that didn't feel so grand that really kind of the, the smaller moments became more and more important. And for me, this was a very small moment of just two people enjoying themselves on the beach. You know, I did the drawing in a couple hours, um, uh, sitting there uh, and really kind of understanding that this was something special for me. Uh, it was a change of pace. Uh, it wasn't such a grand design. It's just a landscape with a couple of people in it sitting at the beach. And that was really, and that, that really has influenced me going forward is kind of thinking about smaller moments uh, as having more power and more impact on my life. Go to the next slide. Uh, and this one also is kind of about the awkwardness of the pandemic, the uh, masked first date and how you really just can't see uh, so much of what our normal cues are with meeting someone. Um, you know, I, I, I have been talking to somebody for a long time and uh, we really haven't had a good chance to meet. And, uh, you know, it kind of feels like we're both partially wearing a mask because we can't, we haven't had the opportunity to really spend time together. And it, this painting kind of came out of that and that thinking about how, you know, we're all partially a little bit covered during the pandemic, a little bit hidden. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a very fast painting. It was two sessions. Uh, one was a drawing and the initial color. And then I went back over it and uh, it just felt very much like an impression, a feeling of kind of looking at each other a little suspiciously. Um, playing with color, but also being a little bit wary of things. Um, 
And I think there's one more slide, is that correct, Jen? Nope, that was the end of it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, and I should mention here too, that um, if you all have questions that come to mind um, while we're going along, um, feel free to write them in the, in the chat section. Um, we're gonna bring everybody up together um, um, at the end of the hour here. Um, so we'll have a little time for conversation and um, uh, Q and A. Um, so uh, Kaleidoscope um, is the show of paintings by James Stephen Terrell. Um, he is a native Washingtonian, the son of a prominent pastor and a superior court judge. He graduated from Gonzaga College High School and received a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Howard University. Uh, then Terrell moved up north to New York and went on to earn a Master of Fine Arts from the Parsons School of Design and a Master of Divinity degree from Union Theological Seminary while also taking fine arts classes at Columbia University. He's exhibited his work nationwide at both galleries and museums and currently teaches art in the DC public schools. Welcome, James. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate the MPA for inviting me to the exhibit. Thank you very much. All right, so my art is inspired by the colored stained glass window, windows found in the black Baptist churches and also in the Roman Catholic churches. I grew up in the church because my dad was and still is a Baptist pastor who sent me to get educated in Catholic schools in DC. The black lines break up the space while simultaneously outlining the shapes that make up the figure hidden in plain sight. My art is about the sectioning of space with shapes. It involves the placement of geometric patterns which are laid upon the figure which is divided by various types of lines. It is the intersection and combination of abstraction and reality. We can move to the next slide. The flat, bright, bold, vibrant, and contrasting color blocking techniques that are found in my art are used to unlock and interlock memories from life experiences. My work incorporates the principles of opt art as displayed by the artists Bridget Riley and Victor Vassarelli. The contrasting colors cause the artwork to vibrate. The use of contrasting colors empowers, energizes the viewers by radiating energy. I use the color blocking techniques of Joseph Albers to show how various colors respond and interact when placed side by side within and around the subject matter of the figure. But I also like the artist Piet Mondrian. The picture playing on the canvas is divided by black lines, but they come together to create shapes. But unlike Mondrian, the figures interact with the space they are in as they fuse into the shape and the patterns. So this picture here is a picture of my wife. She has our whole house filled with plants. And being home during the pandemic, I was able to actually see how these plants are interacting in our lives. Instead of curtains, we have plants that block our windows, huge plants. And so this picture was an ode to my wife. You can go to the next slide. James, I think you're muted. This picture here deals with the pandemic. Right when the pandemic hit, me and my wife were set to go on a bunch of trips we had planned. And then all of a sudden, the whole city shut down. Well, I guess the whole US shut down. And so we were all dressed up and had no place to go. And this was the image of the virus interacting with the zigzag lines behind us and into our clothing and that we were all set to go somewhere and we could not get out of the house. <laughs> but the um, at the same, same time, 
the bright, bold color choices and the combination and placement are inspired by the group called Afrocobra, who use these bright and bold colors to energize the paintings and energize the people who are looking at the paintings. You can go to the next slide. This picture here is an example of my, if you look closely and get past the pattern and look inside, you can see that there's two images. And the two images are my two children. During the pandemic, as I was getting up to go to the store to get groceries, my two kids who were trying to process the whole concept of face masks said to me, they found my, we have a collection of African masks in my house. They found two masks, they put them on, they met me at the door and they said, daddy, don't forget your face mask. And I just thought I had to capture that of how they processed the whole concept of wearing a face mask, but that they were wearing two African masks as face masks. The uh, flat, bright, bold, vibrant, and contrasting color blocking techniques that are found in my art are used to unlock and interlock memories from life experiences. My work incorporates the principle of opt art as displayed by the artist Bridget Riley and the contrasting colors of my artwork using to vibrate the artwork. Art is about balance. It's not stagnant. It keeps the eye and the brain moving, searching until hidden images are found. The placement of color, line, and pattern keeps the viewers engaged. Today, due to the um, technology and the internet, we live in a time where we have a very short attention span. So my art tries to command the viewer to take a moment to stand at a distance to look at the art and engage the art because the art takes time to unfold. When you spend time in front of the canvas, the colors, lines, shapes play off each other, allowing figures not seen at first glance to emerge from the picture plan, picture plane. Let's move to the next slide. The art is trying to be optically striking and must be given time to unfold in the eyes and brain of the viewer so you can process what's being observed. When you spend time observing the painting, it brings about discovery and rediscovering. That is key for the viewer to fully engage the story being told and presented. This picture here is my interpretation of The Last Supper. You see the image of Christ at the head of the table and you see the other disciples around the table at the top and the bottom. And you see Judas with the 30 pieces of silver, which are circles around his head and his eyes, you see the dollar signs. The images here are taken from different variations of African masks that I have researched. You can go to the next slide. So the art is also inspired by the linear figurative abstraction of Picasso and Keith Haring and African mass. The color, line, shape, and placement keeps the eye moving in and out, around, up and down while crisscrossing the canvas until the figure unfolds and comes forth emerging from beneath the layered patterns. The art is thought provoking, musical, emotional, and atmospheric. In this picture, you see two couples embedded within these shapes and patterns of a quilt design that I had found. Uh, quilt designs are very important to me because my father's mother was a quilt maker. And he often talked about the days he sat with his other brothers and sisters and cousins as his mother and friends sat and made quilts together. So in the middle, you see two couples fused into the canvas, surrounded by different shapes. 
And I think that's it. Is there another slide? Oh, this slide here is called the pandemic. And here there's an image that is embedded or fused within the pattern of this whole pandemic situation. He's kind of confused as to what's going on. And I tried to use the pattern to show the, the virus affecting the person's inner self. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, all of you. That was that was really wonderful. Um, so here we are. Um, I think I said folks could put um, questions in the chat, and I think I meant put it in the Q and A. <laughs> so if you think of anything, um, you just would love to know that um, that these guys didn't mention. Um, feel free to put it in there. Um, I wanted to take a little time here. I have a couple of questions, um, and also. I thought you all might have some questions of each other. Um, so um, I think I'll start out and just ask um, one question um, and then and then uh, give you all a chance and then we'll see if, if we have some questions in the uh, on the screen. Um, so I just want to ask all of you or any of you um, about um, the, the idea of a sense of theater. Um, which I, you know, I've, I see that in, in each of your work. Um, and I just thought um, you might want to uh, talk a little bit more about that, any of the three of you. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, I've, I've often considered, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be fun to try to create um, shadow puppets? And I've seen some wonderful shadow puppet shows that, uh, I, I can imagine my work moving in that direction if I could develop that skill. But um, sometimes people also look at my pieces and think like they expect it to move, which shocks me. I'm like, D what, what more do you want from me? <laughs> um, but uh, there's something about the light and, and the format, the box kind of feeling like it, there, it is sort of a stage uh, or like a television or, or some other viewing device, uh, maybe even thinking more toward um, early cinema, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And certainly uh, there Norman, are stories. Your work is so about. theatrical, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. I do think about it too. Um, in a sense, I, I'm a huge opera fan uh, and you know, I've done a few opera paintings in my time. Uh, but even when I'm thinking in terms of working on a figurative piece, I do, I take a lot of my cues from the stage uh, of just kind of how to set up um, uh, composition and how deep the space is. You know, most of the spaces I work in are fairly shallow uh, and kind of feel that stage-like idea to them. Um, and then, you know, artificial color is all over <laughs> for me. Uh, you know, I, I, I work a lot from life with my students and in my kind of practice. But once I get into uh, working in my professional capacity, you know, things are drawn from nature, but really, you know, as artificial as I can get them. And I think that kind of relates to the, the theatrical aspects and the emotions that you go for in them. Kind of a heightened sense of reality there. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I'm trying to do right at the moment is I want to create a glass stage. Glass on the bottom, glass at the ceiling, glass on the sides, and present the work through a projection and have the images start to move to music and have the shapes within the images flip around until the image is formed. That's what I'm working on right now. Awesome. That'd be amazing. I'd love to see that. So, <laughs> if, so James, you then see that your paintings as being sort of frozen moments in something that is kind of in motion? Yeah, I want to make them in motion so that you would see like the different checkered type of images. They would flip and the shapes would change colors, move around until the image comes back forth around. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Like, I don't know if you've ever been to the Spy Museum in D.C., but they have a glass room where they have all these images projected moving up and down around in circles. I want to make 
my artwork do that. Yeah. Let us know when you. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, question for Matt from the Q and A. Um, um, uh, oh, specifically relating to your background, um, <laughs> how does fear enter your work? Well, yeah, I, she's referring to the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus uh, Bosch. Um, and, you know, for me, this is actually this background is a kind of a teaching joke about how teaching in pandemic and online is, you know, heaven in one sense where, you know, you sleep in, you don't have to bathe. Um, you know, you can <laughs> have your breakfast while you're preparing for classes and, um, and, uh, and then also kind of the hell aspect of it where you know, you're having struggling so much more to connect with students and, and kind of keep everyone engaged in the same way. Um, but in my own work, you know, I'm always kind of playing with uh, teetering on failure. Uh, you know, a lot of my acts that I do in making my paintings uh, are acts that more often than not go wrong. Uh, you know, I've, I've learned how to make the best of them, to optimize the chances of something happening right. Uh, but more often than not, there, there is just, oh, I can get this part to work and not this part. Uh, and I have to kind of accept that as part of the process and then repaint the entire thing and do it again. Uh, and, you know, in the subjects, I think that there's a kind of a parallel idea to that. Uh, where, um, you know, I think it was Shanti Norris I was talking to about how a lot of my work um, deals with the kind of the things that interrupt your journey more than how to get on the journey. It's, it's where you get stuck or where you get kind of trapped there. Um, uh, you know, it may not, it's not a permanent thing, but it's a, it's a roadblock. And all those, that idea of a roadblock as being essential to the journey, as being actually the journey uh, where your experiences happen. You know, when you have plans things and things are all going to plan, the, the journey is done. But once something happens, those are the stories you tell, those are the, the places where feelings come out and emotions come out. Uh, playing off what he just said about the whole aspect of fear and moving with the journey is very important because I have two kids who were five years old, three years old. And some of the paintings I had in that show, working with the kids, they had spilled paint on them. I turned my back, they didn't drew on them. Had to go back and fix many of those paintings step by step, piece by piece. <laughs> it was, but it was the whole journey aspect of dealing with that and not being afraid to have them be themselves. You know, you can't stop a kid from being a kid. But I had to also, you know, understand that, you know, it's a journey and things change, things happen, but you, you have to move with that. Yeah, kind of incorporate the unknown. Yeah, yeah. Well, that kind of brings me to <clears throat> something I kept thinking about when you all were talking. Um, and that is um, just uh, it's similar to, to, to fear is mystery. Um, I think it kind of runs parallel in, in all of your work that there's this sort of mystery. I mean, I think with Melanie, your work kind of explores mystery through history, right? A little bit. Um, did you want to talk about that a little bit? I suppose it's, it's trying to do both, both uh, illuminate the histories, but also work within this format that is inherently mysterious sort of like a cabinet of curiosities that that it's not mysterious in itself but it evokes that feeling if that makes sense and i suppose there there's an element of solving the puzzle you know it the paint the pieces are readable maybe in a more literal way than a lot of artwork is but it takes some time to read it figure it out yeah yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, <laughs> um, we have a question here for Matt um, talking about your interest in figuration. Um, and where do you see figuration fitting into contemporary art? And what's your connection to it and interest in it? Um, 
where is that rooted? Well, you know, I, I've been, um, for me, I don't really care about where other people are thinking about contemporary art. I, I do th find it really nice how big figuration has come back. Uh, it's exciting for me. Um, but, you know, for me, drawing and working from life and experiencing and kind of recording the world around me is the beginning for everything. Uh, and that's, you know, I, when I'm teaching drawing, you know, that's home for me. Um, and it's, uh, you know, looking and observing. Uh, I kind of had a realization a little while ago about the difference between a photograph and a, and a drawing. And a photograph, you take the picture and then you go back and you look at it for your memories. In the drawing, you have to look and observe every piece of the drawing that you make and, and be engaged and, and record that in your own memory as you're making it. Uh, and so that the action is and the, um, and the kind of the making of the memory is in the action instead of a recording that you come back to and say, oh, well, that was the memory. You know, that was the thing that happened. Uh, and, and that for me is really kind of the basis of my understanding for being a figurative artist. Yeah, and you all in your own way um, work with the figure. Yeah. Did, uh, did anybody else want to say anything about figuration? Okay. Um, I have a, a, another question here that um, sort of incorporates a couple of questions that we have about process. We have someone wanting to know from James, um, how does he uh, work with all those straight lines? Um, and um, I think that really the, the root of process questions um, in, in my mind right now for all of you is um, what is your balance in your work and in your process between planning and evolving? Because I think you both have, you all have kind of a, a, a balance between those two things or, or kind of a dance between them that the conversation that you, you have while you're working. So I'm, I'm curious mm. about that. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your processes too in, in, in the answers. Well, I would say that um, in terms of my work, um, the straight lines are, are coming from using the ruler <laughs> in my artwork. It's a tedious process, step by step, for this particular series. Some work I've I've done, I just go freehand and just draw straight out. But this series, I've sat down, and actually measured out pieces step by step. Just going back to the whole aspect of how quilt making was made, because my dad, you know, from like my dad telling me about how his mother made quilts. And that was used with the whole measurements. And that was my aspect. But in terms of um, evolving, the work itself, when I draw it out, I can't see how it's going to look when it's done. I, I guess the artwork speaks to me and tells me where to place the colors. So you're like I'll, I'll, I will draw the picture out, but I don't know how it's going to look when it's done. But when I look when I look at it step by step and place the colors, it'll say, "Well, put this put this color here, or put this color there." It's a step by step process. Great, thanks. How about you, Melanie? I think it's uh, in some ways similar to James. I I draw everything out. I plan a lot, but the way it all comes together is somewhat um, a surprise every time. So I pretty much know what the paper cut is going to look like, but what will it look like when I put uh, different colors of backing paper behind it? What will it look like when I change where the lights go? And I've been playing around more with like the placement of the lights and how that changes the scene. And also when I wrap the piece in the, the pattern, how, how are the colors gonna work? Cause it, it's really hard to predict once you have the backlighting involved, how, how the light is gonna influence the backing paper and then um, is how it's gonna interact with these two layers, you can't really sketch it out, especially because the way the light works in the room is gonna 
be different um, on on the pattern paper versus the the cutout. So sometimes it's kind of like I I put it all together. I'm like that's not what I wanted, <laughs> but but then it's kind of like. Um, hearing a song the first time you're like, I don't know if I like this song. And then after a while you're like, oh, I kind of like the song. Uh, it, it sort of sinks in like, yeah, that that is what I meant to do. <laughs> in the cases where it's not, then the, those pieces um, get reworked, but luckily I don't have to do it very often. Great. Thanks. You. How about you, Matt? Well, I, I, you know, some of this I addressed a little bit before how um, my, Act of painting it usually is high risk and and involve it involves kind of uh, a lot of um, kind of accepting failure uh, in, in the in the actions and because of that my paintings can take anywhere from two sessions a drawing and and a, a and one layer of paint to a year or longer sometimes um, and uh, I you know I really have no idea how it's going to go. <laughs> yeah, you're really heavy on the uh, on the evolution part. Yeah, lots of evolution in some of them. Uh, you know, my friends and fellow artists who come to my studio, uh, I, actually, Andrea, who asked the question before about figuration, he, um, he, he stopped, you know, trying to get opinions of paintings in progress because because, you know, the next time he comes in, it's a hundred times different painting. Uh, and you know, you have no idea where it's going to be. Um, and I'm, I just am never, I, 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 you know, people talk about like, when's a painting finished? Uh, and for me, it's when I'm not angry at it anymore <laughs> because it's, you know, this is so messed up. I can't deal with that. Uh, and often, you know, even the, the narrative will really change throughout some paintings life and become just radically different uh, until, you know, the, the accidents happen Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it, embracing the hard work of the act of painting. Yeah. 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 Well, this has been the, a really great conversation. Um, I just want to, we're over time a little bit, but I wanted, I said I'd give you guys a chance to ask each other questions if you <laughs> had a chance. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to take a, a little time for that if, if any of you want to do that. I have a question for um, both of you, since both of you work with, it seems like, um, per personal memories. How does your memory of that moment change the, through the process of making the painting and having the painting? Or does it change? Hmm. Um, it doesn't change really. Like the pictures that I have of the man and woman together was, I guess, was me and my wife during the pandemic and how we were able to go stronger together during that time, because we were stuck in the house. <laughs> I was at work normally every day, nine to five, come home, see them for a couple hours and go to bed. And then when the pandemic hit, I was there 24 seven with the kids and my wife nonstop. And a lot of folks broke up during that time because they didn't know how to deal with people they were actually married to <laughs> or living with. But we were able to work that out and able to work together and um, deal with the whole family structure. It was a process that I had to actually understand, but um, it worked out for our benefit, I would say. You know, for me, uh, memory and narrative, um, you know, I often like to use old stories as kind of the, the basis and, and kind of infuse them with my own memory. Um, you know, there's, uh, and the way I, I, I'm really kind of thinking of it is, you know, if uh, there's a painting that is on some of the advertisements, but I, it's in a different show now at Brentwood uh, Art Exchange um, called The Decameron, and it's based off the Boccaccio story. Uh, and, and it was actually, I did it simultaneously with the quarantine painting uh, in there, and, and there's this you know, interaction, uh, I, we've, you know, I came up with my group, like you're my people, we're, the only, we're gonna only hang out with each other for, you know, this period of time while we figure this out, and, uh, understand, you know, what we can do. 
Uh, like the and, Decameron. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we had our little Decameron uh, moment, you know. Um, and, you know, I'm lucky in the place I live that I have a big backyard. Uh, and so that kind of became our meeting spot with a little campfire and some booze and um, playing some music and just kind of talking. And it gave us a chance to be outside and distanced and a little bit and have that. And um, it, the way that now, when I bring that into a painting, you know, and, and I think I'm thinking only about formal qualities, I'm really thinking as much about the interactions that I've had that have brought that painting about. And, and, and I think that even the success and the failure of the painting is really kind of about the quality of my understanding of how well of that memory and, and you know, the depth of it. Because you can have something that's very surface and compelling and then something that's, you know, deeper and more, uh, have more meaningful over time. And I think it just shows up in the paint, right? It, it just shows what you're what you're really thinking about or how, how meaningful or good or bad or, or I don't know, gray that experience is. Yeah, I also think about that aspect is that when you're doing a painting, it's about not giving up. How do you make things work? It's like life, the situations are up, down, all around. How do you go back to something and go back and say, I'm gonna make this work out. I'm gonna sit down and put this back together piece by piece, step by step and make this work. And there's always a way. Yeah, but not always uh, the first try. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is great. I could do this all night. Um, I think we probably need to close up um, because we've, we've gone over a little bit here. But um, I just really appreciate um, getting to hang out with all of your work um, as, as we get to do, those of us who, who work in the gallery, um, appreciate all of your willingness to share about your processes and, and your thoughts and um, what kind of makes it happen. And um, just, it's, it's, it's great to have you all here. And um, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you, Nancy and Jen. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Good to see you guys. Yep. See you soon. Have a good Bye. night. Take care. See you everybody. Saturday, Melanie. See you. Everybody go back. We'll start working. Yep. <laughs>